Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Art of Kindness. My name is Dr. Julie Fratantoni, and I am a cognitive neuroscientist at UT Dallas Center for Brain Health. And so welcome, and um, we're so excited that you have tuned in tonight for our second annual Art of Kindness event. So I have um, just quickly want to remind you, I know we're all getting used to these virtual events now, but this is the webinar format. So um, not a regular Zoom meeting. So you're only going to see and hear those of us presenting as panelists. We won't be able to see or hear any of you attending, um, but you can communicate with us by submitting your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we encourage you to do that. We would love for you to ask your questions and we'll be pausing to um, hear from you. So just know that you can do that. Um, so like I said, my name is Julie and I have the privilege of getting to lead up our kindness initiative at the Center for Brain Health. And really our, our goal is to amplify the neuroscience research that we're doing about kindness, compassion, and empathy, and um, translate that into programs that the community can access. And so this is one of those ways. Um, this event is really fun for me because it brings together some of my favorite things, being a collaboration between both art and science. And this event is, um, even more elevated than last year because I have gotten to collaborate with some incredible humans um, at UT Dallas. And so this is a cross-disciplinary effort. This is bringing together the School of um, Brain and Behavioral Sciences with the Center for Brain Health. This is involving uh, A-Tech, Arts, Technology, and Emerging Communications, and Computer Science. So UT Dallas, um, we are bridging across um, and working together and it has been so much fun. So I'm really excited to introduce you to my co-hosts and the ones that have helped create and make this event spectacular. And so the first one is Caroline Culver, if you'll turn on your camera so everyone can see you. Um, Hey, so she is a master's student in the Applied Cognition and Neuroscience program at UT Dallas, and she has also been a longtime intern at the Center for Brain Health. Um, her favorite neuroscience concept from the Compass, which are, we'll tell you what that is in a second, is that of connectivity. And you're going to hear the theme of connectivity pop up again and again throughout this event. So um, her own artistic endeavors are heavily inspired by artists like Andy Warhol, Keith Haring, and Dahlia Raz. So Caroline, um, so grateful to get to partner with you you on this. Next, I want to introduce you to Karen Dore, who is such a catalyst for change and has been a master connector in terms of connecting me to um, the other members, co-hosts that are putting this on. But Karen is an assistant professor of instruction in the computer science department at UT Dallas, and her research focuses on computer science education. She has worked as also as a, and Karen, is your camera on? There we go. I can see you. Um, She's worked as a jewelry artist and instructor. She's won national and international awards for her organic jewelry designs, fabricated in metal, clay, and enamel using techniques informed by her material science engineering education and background. So, hey, Karen. And Karen connected me to Andrew Scott, who is um, a professor at our School of Arts, Technology, and Emerging Communications. And Andrew, are you on? There you are, hey. Um, and so he is an artist and an educator. He's working at the intersection of digital fabrication technologies and traditional fine arts practice. And so he works in a variety of scales and diverse materials. He creates work that's both technically compelling and socially relevant. And Andrew has work all over the city of Dallas. And so definitely check out um, his amazing art. And then Andrew connected me to Liz Trosper. And so Liz, if you'll turn your camera on, she um, is an internationally exhibited artist, educator, and writer. She's based right here in Dallas, Texas. She teaches as an assistant professor of instruction in ATEC at UTD. And um, her artwork is represented by Barry Whistler Gallery in Dallas, um, by Danae HI Digital Art Network with Lafay Mafaye Gallery in Paris. Okay, so that's Caroline, Karen, Andrew, and Liz, and could not have put this together without them. So thank you guys so much. Um, next, this is an art contest after all. And so I wanna introduce you quickly to our three judges. So our first judge is Randy Haney. Randy, if you'll turn your camera on so everyone can see you. 
Randy is a retired high school art teacher. He's taught for the last 35 years. He is also a working artist. He loves to create in oil, watercolor, digital media, and mural painting. Randy's fascinated with the discoveries of brain science and what we're learning about our internal world and human interaction. Um, he also taught uh, the student that won the Art of Kindness last year. And so we're so excited to have him back. When I asked him um, who his favorite artist is, he says he has too many to list, but currently Max Smith, a plain art painter out of Arizona is inspiring him. Next, I wanna introduce you to Dr. Lori Cook. Um, Lori, if we can see you. Um, she is a cognitive neuroscientist at the Center for Brain Health. She is the director of clinical research here at the center. And her research has focused largely on long-term recovery of youth after brain injury. She's done work supporting youth athletes um, and the persistent effects of concussion. Dr. Cook has two decades of child and adolescent research under her belt, and she's passionate about translating our research discoveries to equip and empower students of all ages and levels to reach their highest brain potential. Lori's um, favorite artist is Jonas Gerard, and we are lucky enough to have a few of his pieces at the Center for Brain Health, so definitely come take a peek at those if you get a chance. Next, I wanna to introduce to you Paul Fishwick, our third and final judge. And he is a distinguished university chair of arts, technology and emerging communications and a professor of computer science here at UT Dallas. Paul is interested in ways to connect both art and science. And um, his favorite artist when I asked him is Thomas Gainsborough from the 18th century and Magritte and um, his favorite genre is surrealism. So hello, Paul, and thank you for judging. Okay, so let's jump into it without any further ado. So we're gonna to explain to you a little bit more about the contest and what the students did. You're gonna to get to hear directly from the finalists themselves. This is the best part. They're gonna share with you about their work and what they learned. Then you as the audience, this is your time to shine. You're gonna to get to vote on your favorite. And then we're gonna share with you a little bit more about the impact of what we're doing and what we have coming up next and we'll announce the winners. So the contest. So like I mentioned last year was the first year doing this event and um, we launched our kindness initiative. Thank you and special shout out to Hero and the Beneficent Company. Um, but this contest really started from a desire to engage students and the greater community with our kindness initiative and what we're doing. And really the neuroscience of kindness is not something that's widely known. And so we wanted to make it tangible and accessible and um, to students across disciplines as well, not just those that are in the sciences. So what we did was this year we put together a compass and we're calling it the neurokindness synectic compass. We're gonna break down what that means, but essentially for the contest, the contestants had to incorporate three main aspects, one, the neuroscience of kindness. We gave them some concepts to choose from. Two, some art synectic triggers. We'll explain what that means, don't worry. And three, a COVID concept word. And we put those all together in this really neat compass and we're gonna explain what all these pieces are. But I wanted to just say real quickly that we wanted to include an opportunity and really a space to process what's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic into this competition. Um, because kindness and brain health have really never been more relevant than they are now. And this pandemic has really put a spotlight, not just on our mental health and our brain health, but truly our inherent need as humans for connection and support. And kindness is at the very foundation of that. And so what a more um, relevant time to tie all these things together. So next I'm going to pass the torch to Caroline and she is gonna walk you through um, the five different neuroscience concepts that the students got to um, incorporate into their work and choose from. Hi guys. So there is a lot to the neuroscience of kindness, like Julie mentioned, a lot yet to be discovered. But we wanted to really bring fundamental concepts and make them really user friendly for applicants to get a glimpse into the neuroscience research realm as they tackled this challenge. So for each of the five concepts, we pulled overarching ideas and condensed them in a way that hopefully afforded the students, the artists, an opportunity to get familiarized before deciding which of the five they felt most drawn to. 
So just going down the line, I'm going to reiterate some of the information we provided to the students and present a little more of the science for everyone. So starting with reward systems, when you are kind, you activate your brain's positive neuropharmacy, the reward system, which produces the same positive feelings in your brain as when you enjoy your favorite dessert. Over time and with repetition, your brain learns that kind behavior is rewarding, motivating you to do it again. We also provided students with a scientific article to supplement each of these concepts for more in-depth information. And the paper we chose for reward systems explores the benefits of promoting kindness in the form of a game. Participants were presented quests or challenges in various persuasive formats and categories to perform random acts of kindness. These categories included things like being positive, expressing gratitude, engaging in meaningful interactions, being helpful, et cetera. Overall, all of the challenges, no matter the category or how the challenge was delivered, showed benefits for behavioral intention, meaning that treating kindness like a personal quest drives reward and motivation to continue doing so. When we accomplish something that makes us feel good, like being able to complete even just one random act of kindness per day, kind of check that off of our to-do list, our brain takes note of that feeling of accomplishment and motivates us to do it again. So practicing kindness is not only rewarding on the receiving end, but especially on the giving end. Next, we have mirror neurons. And these are brain cells that enable humans to mirror the emotions and actions that are observed in others. These neurons fire both when we act and when we observe the same act performed by another, hence the term mirror. The article we provided to supplement this idea shows a vast array of evidence confirming this idea that the ability to fire neurons just by perceiving another's experience is creating a neural basis for empathy, especially when recognizing that the ability to take someone else's perspective and put yourself in someone else's shoes is a big part of what empathy is. The paper focuses on one main psychological function that empathy serves being the ability to understand other people's intentions. The idea is that if we can experience the mental state of a fellow person, we can understand their reasons for acting in a given way and understand the intentions underlying their behavior. For example, if we see a friend has been upset by an event and becomes increasingly sad, we can understand why our friend might behave in a certain way in response because our brain might be firing in a similar way mirroring their experience. And this understanding opens the door for us to empathize with our friend and respond in a way that is kind. Moving on, one of my personal favorites and a big motivator for events like this is the idea that kindness can be trained. Just like any other skill, kindness can be strengthened with practice. Nobody is inherently limited to a certain amount of kindness, which is good for us because that means everyone is capable of improving in this regard. When you push yourself to think flexibly, generate multiple solutions, and view people in their contexts from a broader perspective, you sharpen those cognitive skills that continuously refuel your ability to practice empathy and compassion. The paper we provided for this topic explored the impact that compassion and empathy training have on brain plasticity. Brain plasticity simply being the ability of the brain to modify its connections or rewire itself, which is also something that can be improved. Generally, the more brain plasticity, the better. Participants who are trained in empathy and compassion showed increased brain plasticity as they were much better at bouncing back after being exposed to negative things, suggesting that not only can empathy and compassion be trained or improved, but they are also valuable coping strategies to overcome distress and strengthen resilience. Following that, we have the parasympathetic system. Many of you are probably familiar with a mechanism driven by the sympathetic nervous system called fight or flight, something we all know to be widely associated with experiences of stress and fear. But here we wanna redirect our attention to the flip side of that, a mechanism commonly referred to as rest and digest, which is driven by the parasympathetic nervous system. This is the brain's relaxation command center it allows our mind and body to slow down and prepare for whatever comes next in a rejuvenated manner. Where fight or flight would raise our heart rate, rest and digest would slow it down. And practicing compassion and kindness has been shown to 
improve this parasympathetic response with leading to better health outcomes while reducing stress and fear. The article we provided maintains this idea that training and cultivating compassion derives these positive outcomes. And lastly, we have connectivity. Brain connectivity is describing probably what you would imagine parts of your brain are coming together to combine their working contributions by way of white matter tracks. White matter is the tissue in your brain that lives beneath the cortical surface, uh, below the direct part of the brain that we would see on the outside, which is made of gray matter. In this way, white matter is a lot like the subcortical highways of the brain. And as is with real highways, the better built these tracks are, the stronger the tracks are, the more efficient the system is as a whole. So there are definitely benefits to having strong connections and building as many connections as possible and practicing kindness definitely gives us that boost. The more you practice, the stronger those connections become, essentially training your brain to be kinder, to be healthier and to be happier. This helps buffer against negative effects of stress, boosts your immune system, and decreases anxiety and depression, which I think we can all agree are good outcomes. So that wraps up the five neuroscience concepts that all applicants had to choose from for the art pieces. Hopefully this information will kind of give everyone an opportunity to maybe connect some of the dots, recognize and appreciate how each of the finalists integrated their chosen concept into their piece when we see them later on. Now I'm going to pass it on to Andrew Scott, and he's going to tell you guys about the artistic component of this challenge, Synaptic Triggers. Um, when I was uh, approached uh, by Julie and Karen about this project, and they talked about uh, wanting to do a project that centered kindness, but that also incorporated the arts and computer engineering and computer science, into a, into a broad framework to achieve this goal, I immediately thought of uh, the synectic strategy, a, a synectic strategy. Synectics is a word that is um, rooted in the Greek word synetikos, and it literally means how we bring things together. And, it, and it's a des design philosophy, a method of working that centers uh, bringing things together and connecting things that are seemingly unrelated. And usually some of the strategies that we use to uh, bring these things together are analogic thinking, um, mythological myth-making, uh, using symbolic systems and or uh, transformational uh, strategies. And a lot of these things are often uh, encapsulated in some of the words that you see before you, which are what we call uh, syn synectic triggers. And usually the, the kind of design exercises and creativity exercises that we engaged in, engage in is that we choose two or three of these things uh, and we combine them to create or to create something that represents the whole of the three working together. So you might subtract, add and disguise and create an artwork that's based or, or use a design approach that's based on that. Now, when you take that and you combine this with the uh, with some of the uh, neuroscience concepts, it even further's amplifies the synectic potential and and also the creative potential and design potential and the values of the connections that are made. Now, while the work that you're going to see tonight is going to center how artists have used this work, the same concepts and ideas have broad applications and potential for folks that are working in areas like engineering and computer science, because it's, a, it's it, what it describes more than anything else is, is a method of thinking and a method of approaching uh, problem solving activities. Now, within the context of our project, computer science engineering provides the framework and methodology for how we communicate uh, some of the ideas and get some of the ideas that we're working on together uh, off of our um, off, of, off of our off of our sketchbooks and out of our sketchbooks and into the real world and someone who's uh, done that very effectively for us across a number of different platforms is my colleague who I'll present to you at this time and that's Karen Dorr. Thank you. 
Yeah, so as we've been meeting and planning this project, we've had these discussions about, uh, you know, this is a contest um, about the art of kindness. So the art part is obvious and the neuroscience of kindness is obvious, but it's not quite so obvious why and how CS and engineering are applicable in this, uh, in this project. And so, um, you know, one of the things that's been interesting to me as I've been researching kind of this neuroscience of well-being is that at schools like Harvard, the two most popular courses are computer science and the science of happiness. And so what we'd like to do is actually combine that with making art, um, where art is really this embodied contemplative practice, and that we're really trying to build interdisciplinary um, collaboration across departments so that the students can actually um, make friends across, um, you know, departments and start creating some pretty cool teams. Um, so CS, computer science, is actually a definition of that. My favorite definition is from Paul Fishwick, and that definition is that computer science is the science of information dynamics. Um, and so in computer science, we create theories and languages and platforms, frameworks and technologies. Um, you know, AI systems are really designed to replicate human cognition. And a big part of what's um, the technology right now is this idea of networked connections for communication. And uh, Claude Shannon was a pioneer in computer science. He developed this theory of information where he talked about information as communication where we're looking at a signal that is in a like a background of noise. And I think that we've all seen how the technology really has been, um, you know, kind of used to amplify noise because now we've seen a lot of misinformation and you know the technology can end up being very distracted distractive um, and it's you know can cause some divisiveness so really what we want to do is amplify the signal and in doing that one idea would be to say we want to be having intentional design of technology for connection and, and that connection would be for greater good, like what we're doing tonight. Um, and you know that we've all seen how this virtual connections has really, in terms of COVID, it's made it amazing for us to all still be able to communicate. And the isolation would just be, you know, it's hard to even think about the 1918 flu where there was no virtual connection. So our goal is to really get a harmonic resonance. You know, as Andrew says, uh, we'd like to think of this as a jazz kind of thing. We want, uh, we want to amplify the signal rather than the noise. So for the synectic compass, um, we really wanted to make this um, interaction, um, you know, to engage and enhance the student's curiosity. And our inspiration uh, came from two places. One is um, Philip Pullman, who is the author of His Dark Materials, the trilogy. In that story, there, uh, the main character had this um, tool called an alethiometer. It was a truth meter. And she would think of a question and then she would turn these dials that had symbols on them. And that would allow her to kind of connect with her embodied like intuition. And that is, really building on what Ada Lovelace had come up with this idea. She was kind of the first, she worked with Charles Babbage, but she realized that, you know, you could create a computer program, the instructions for this process, and you could create that and it could be separate from the actual machinery. And she realized that you could use, essentially the program could be using symbols and those symbols could be used to represent anything. And she really thought that it would be cool to use um, computing to create poetry. So she, you know, at the very beginning uh, was really interested in using computing for creative expression. And so um, in the, you know, with the alethiometer, one way to think about that is that computers can ex essentially be extending our cognition you know, so that our cognition is not really just brain bound. Um, and that um, for
for this project, we could think of it that way that the, um, you know, the, so the students had this idea of their COVID experience, right? That's their embodied experience, the feelings, uh, the emotions, and that we wanted them to engage with a neuroscience concept. So that's kind of top down, higher order thinking. Whereas the uh, embodied experience is this bottom up feeling of, you know, their emotions. And the synectics is what's allowing the students to kind of make the connections between the top down and bottom up. Um, and then the students are reflecting on that and then they're making an expression, um, an expression of art. So once again, the synectics compass, the idea was that we could make this uh, kind of a, a fun, uh, playful tool to support uh, students' you know, curiosity and learning about all these different concepts. Um, our first attempt, our first pass at this um, was to create a tangible printout that you could you know, print this out and cut it out and have a tangible product. Um, and I wanna throw a shout out to Leanne Dorr for doing all the artwork. Um, but then we decided we should make it as a virtual um, interactive um, tool. So I uh, went onto a, a website that is a code sharing platform so that students could actually, you know, when they click to go play with this digital tool, they could actually fork the code and, you know, play with it, remix it and whatnot. And that it's made using uh, processing, uh, JavaScript version of processing. And those are some of the things, the languages that we teach our students here, the ATEC students, but the engineering students don't normally get to play with this creative coding. So we're hoping that that would be a fun thing for them. So um, yeah, so that's the story of the Synectics Compass. And now I will uh, pass on to Liz, who's gonna talk more about this exact um, process that students went through. Thank you, Karen. And hello, everyone. Um, so as we engage students in the making component of this very deep well of research <laughs> that you've all um, listened to, um, we began that process by asking the students to sit for a moment and notice what you think um, about your experience of the pandemic and come up with one word, right? Really strict limitation, come up with one word. And what um, you'll see here, and just take a moment to notice some very obvious trends um, that came up, things like loneliness, isolation, um, and variations thereon um, were overwhelmingly um, thematic in what uh, came out of that. But what I also hope you'll notice um, are words like connection, adaptation. Um, and uh, I think that just beneath that um, feeling of loneliness is a desire for connection. Um, and, and that is something that runs throughout some of the research that um, you're, you're seeing um, and that has just been presented. Um, so, um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, so when we look at, um, this assignment, right? And we look at um, the, the opportunities to engage students um, or people working uh, on this idea is, we really had to think about how do we make this deeply complex scientific um, methodology accessible um, to foundation students um, in engineering and computer science um, and in ATEC um, and beyond, right? How do we make this accessible? How do we engage people and really provide an on-ramp, um, whether it's to college students or um, any audience with no familiarity with this sort of very challenging, deeply complex research? Um, and really what we came up with is a response that um, really we, we have to go to students and show them how to tackle an idea, right? How do we think deeply about conceptual, conceptual competence in, in design and art making, okay? Um, and in this specific example, um, we, we're asking students to make art, right? And in, in my courses that I teach, it's digital art, 
Um, but in engineering and computer science, it can be something totally different, right? But the bottom line is the question is how do we approach a very complex idea and make something? And if you look at the prompts here, we have neuroscience, three synaptic, synaptic triggers, and a theme word, um, a COVID theme word. And so that web in and of itself, though it's only five points, creates a mesh of um, a very unique um, and uh, interwoven ideas that is a bit of a conceptual ramp, especially if you're just beginning your art making journey. Um, so as you heard Professor Scott and Doran and Caroline mention, um, uh, the various um, approaches to research and uh, in neuroscience um, and computer science, Professor Scott kind of detailed the synaptic framework of triggers. We sort of decided that would be the perfect approach and ramp to engaging these ideas. Um, and what it allowed was to really make concrete um, specific approaches to making art and provide words that the students could then begin building and conducting visual research, right? Um, so something like connectivity, when you read that article, you can begin to build images, you can begin to think of uh, maybe actions or verbs or words that, that you could then go and use in your making to transform those images. Um, and so really what we wanted to do was provide a prompt that would launch them into their visual research. And then only after they had gone through this very deep process of reflecting on their word, thinking about the neuroscience, um, thinking about the synaptic prompts, um, and their experience of the pandemic, only then did they begin to actually open up Photoshop and make something. Um, so, and with that, I will pass it back off to you, Julie. Thank you. So in summary, we just gave you a lot of information, but I hope this helps you to appreciate the artwork that you're about to see and that this is really an, a wonderful example of one of the submissions um, and you can see where the synectics show up there, their theme word and um, how they conceptualized this neuroscience concept of connectivity.